Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. Draft horses and forestry. Both have a long history in Virginia. This week we focus on how one farmer in southwestern Virginia is using draft horses to practice what he calls restorative forestry. We also have a story this week about how school kids in Virginia are learning more about where their food comes from. Plus, we have some tips on pruning evergreens in the farmhouse garden. Welcome to this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishy. The Virginia Ag in the Classroom program continues to benefit both teachers and school children. Kids are learning more about where their food comes from and how it's grown, while teachers are having access to readily available lesson plans on horticulture, forestry, and of course agriculture. Officials say Ag in the Classroom has served almost 17,000 teachers since the program began. An estimated half a million students have learned more about the importance of agriculture and forestry in the Old Dominion. Well, this week we visit a, an interesting fellow in southwestern Virginia who's a farmer, a forester, and a draft horse enthusiast. Amy Rocher has the story. It's coming up next during Ag Insights. Forestry is a big contributing factor to Virginia's economy. Today we're in Floyd, Virginia visiting Ridgewind Farm where they do logging and farming a little differently than others. I'm joined by Jason Rutledge, the owner of Ridgewind Farm. Jason, thanks so much for having us out today. Glad to be here. Glad you're here. So tell us how you do things differently. What, what sets you apart from other loggers and farmers? Well, I think the, the horses uh, and draft animal power is a central component in our work uh, that doesn't completely replace uh, uh, tractors uh, or machinery, but it, it is used where we find the horses to be a superior technique. We do single tree selection and pull out one log at a time. And of course, our farming, uh, we use the horses for mowing, for uh, raking, uh, for baling, for plowing. and disking, ordering land up and cultivating land. So, so we use our horses uh, uh, in all of, uh, of our farming and forestry activities uh, uh, as appropriate. So let's talk a little bit about your horses. How many do you have and are you breed specific? Yes, we have 14 Suffolk Punch horses, which is a horse that originated in England from the uh, county of Suffolk, which was the breadbasket of England. It was the Plains. Uh, they're the oldest draft breed uh, as far as uh, documented uh, uh, registry uh, from back in the 1500s. Uh, they uh, uh, are not a flashy horse, they're a plain horse. They've been bred exclusively for working. Um, so uh, we, we keep a, a stallion and, and several mares and, and keep two teams that are always uh, uh, here for us to work in the woods and on our forests. So, uh, and in our forest and in the community, uh, uh, in the forest of the community. Uh, so we have Suffolk Punch draft horses. We keep 14 at the moment. So you have 14 draft horses. What about manpower? Do you, does your, is this a family run business? How many people do you have working here? Well, it, it is a family run business and, and everybody that farms and has a family knows uh, that, that that doesn't always make it easier. Uh, my son and my daughter uh, work with me uh, both uh, part-time because they both have other jobs. And as I mentioned earlier, my daughter is going to nursing school. Uh, and I always uh, have apprentices. I have people that want to learn this skill set that come here and pay for their education uh, with sweat equity. They actually work uh, and learn the skills of, of how to do this work. It is very dangerous work. Fifteen people a year die in Virginia in logging most of the time in the timber felling, the hand felling portion of it. So we do a lot to 
uh, promote a method of logging developed, um, a method of timber felling developed by a Swedish man named Soren Eriksson. Uh, I actually studied with Soren Eriksson over 25 years ago when the Virginia Department of Forestry uh, sent him throughout uh, rural Virginia teaching chainsaw safety and skills. So I have used uh, my position to teach people how to fell trees safely. Uh, there is a technique, there is a method. It's now the method that's also adopted, promoted, and taught by the Virginia Department of Forestry. So it's, so it's very important that, uh, that whoever is helping us knows how to operate safely. I want to talk a little bit about your, your forestry side of your farm. You have a company called Draftwood Forest Products. Tell us a little bit about that, how it came about, and when. Draftwood Forest Products is uh, an attempt to establish a source differentiated identity for our product. Uh, it's like organic. You know, when you buy something organic, you know that the source of the, of the food is different. And Draftwood is horse log lumber from restorative forestry. So it, it's a, it establishes a source differentiated identity that allows the consumer to support good environmental work with their purchasing decision on which forest products to buy. And we produce uh, um, all products that are made out of the species native to uh, the Appalachian forest type. Uh, we sell a lot of white pine into the uh, log cabin uh, markets. Uh, we sell a lot of, uh, of our oak into hardwood flooring uh, processing. Uh, and, and we sell all species that are uh, available to harvest uh, on the restorative forestry uh, basis uh, that, that we use. Uh, and that includes uh, Worst First. Uh, Draftwood is a, a brand name. It was started in 1998, 1998 as a way of, uh, of uh, letting the customer support the, the kind of work that we're doing in the forest uh, for all the benefits that it has and for them to feel like they're a part of doing something differently. By, by it, I call it ecological capitalism. It's letting the people spend their money to support the kind of work that they want to see going on in their community. And that kind of work is very environmentally friendly. Why do you choose to use the draft horses as opposed to some of the lumbering equipment? It's got to be harder work. It is definitely labor intensive. And that's the only real um, drawback is that it takes longer and it takes more human uh, participation. But we choose the horses because uh, they are the ultimate low impact overland extraction technique. They actually can move heavy objects from the stump where the tree is felled to the landing with less uh, environmental impact on the forest soils and on the residual trees. When you're practicing restorative forestry where you take the worst trees first, then you also embrace the concept of what you leave is more important than what you take. So the horses provide us a, a method of removing heavy logs but not damaging the residual trees that we will hope to come back and harvest again in the future. I want you to explain to me a little bit about restorative forestry and the worst first. How do you do that? How, when, you, when you set off on your logging day, how does it go? What, what's, your, what's your process? Well, I think the best way to, to, to start that is, is the differentiation that I make between sustainable and restorative. We know that the quality of the forest products that are being produced in Virginia today are lowering in quality as far as the yield from individual logs. We're not getting as much clear lumber out of the logs we're cutting today as we did 40 years ago. So in that understanding, we know that the quality of the material is in a decline. And I don't understand how we can sustain a decline. If the forest products are declining in, in quality and grade, then it seems to me that we have to do things to improve the forest in order to have a chance to sustain it. So that's why I use the term restorative. I believe that in order for your forestry to be truly sustainable, it must be restorative. And I would like to move the debate away from what is sustainable to what is restorative. And restorative to me means making the forest as much like a native forest as possible in a single entry or a, a single uh, uh, intervention uh, for harvesting. And following the principles of, of uh, imitating nature by taking the worst trees first, 
we leave the best trees, which then began to grow much quicker, as much as 300% growth rate increase from what's called crop tree management, where we actually uh, uh, leave trees uh, that are in the best growing condition and the best specimens and, and on the best site. And when, once the forest is thinned back, those trees then begin to grow much faster. So those are the trees that we will harvest in the future. And we try, we try to follow the principle of, uh, of uh, we will harvest no tree before it's time. And, and every tree does have a time and we do need to harvest trees. So that's what we do. We just harvest the trees that are truly ripe for harvesting. We actually have developed a method called Nature's Tree Marking Paint Indicators, which is 18 signs of visible uh, low productivity in three categories of damage, disease, and inferior. And when three strikes occur on a single individual out of those 18 indicators, then that tree is deemed ripe for harvest. All of this information is available on our website at healingharvestforestfoundation.org. So you talk about taking the worst trees first, but that doesn't mean that your lumber is inferior by any means. Tell me a little bit about your products that you use your lumber for and what your customers have to say about it. Well, worst first doesn't mean that the tree is rotten or, or totally decayed. It just means that it's, uh, that it's not highly productive in its current condition. So when we process the logs from those worst first individually selected trees, they always yield some good lumber. The key there is that we also work on good sites, meaning sites that have an average age range of over 75 years for the trees, uh, that uh, um, have a, a, a good inventory, a, a high stocking rate. The trees are, are often too overcrowded, so we're actually doing a lot of, of thinning of forest, and it follows right into the, uh, the technique that's called crop tree management. Well, talking about restorative forestry, I know that you plant your seedlings, but you plant them a little differently than some other foresters may. Tell us about that. Well, we don't plant trees. And the reason we don't plant trees is because we depend upon natural regeneration. And when you leave the forest in a condition of the best specimens being the dominant trees, then they become a seed source for the future forest. So we don't have to plant any trees, we just remove the forest, remove the trees that need to come out, create enough disturbance and allow enough light to come into the forest that we then get uh, vigorous regeneration. Well, you know, you talk about using the draft horses and I think, to, in my mind, that gives you access to some forest land that you probably can't get machinery up into. Am I right in assuming that? Yes, and you are exactly right. And here are the demographics that support that. The Virginia Forest Landowners Association has conducted surveys of land ownership conditions in the past uh, 30 years that have proven that land ownership, forest land ownership, is becoming a matter of, of smaller and smaller tracts of land. In 99, it was 70% uh, of the land was in 40 acres or less. In 2009, it had gone up to where 70% of the land owned in Virginia was in tracts of 10 acres or less. So the smaller the, the ownership of the land is, the less likely it is to suit conventional harvesting, which means mechanization and generally clear cutting. These small landowners will not allow anybody to cut all the trees around their home that they've built out in the countryside, but they know that trees do need to be harvested because they see natural mortality occurring and trees dying all the time. So what was once a niche of horse logging is now becoming the technique that actually addresses the largest landscape condition in all of Virginia, which is the 70% of the land that's in private ownership in 10 acres or less. So we actually are able to serve those small tracks very efficiently uh, in that we don't have to build roads. Uh, we can move around in our community with just our horses and our log arch and our loaders and trucks. Uh, and we can uh, meet the landowner's objectives, which are the aesthetics, the natural beauty of the forest. We actually go in and harvest trees and they can hardly tell that we're there. And they, they, it's a have your cake and eat it too. They get a little money for the trees that we take out and they still have their forest. So give me some numbers on your forestry production. On an average, we'll harvest 1,500 to 2,000 board feet a day, which is roughly uh, five to seven trees, uh, or about 25 logs. 
Uh, and when we work a five day week, that'll put us up there around six or 7,000 board feet a week. That is low production. Most mechanized guys will harvest uh, uh, 20,000 board feet a day. Um, but our position is that since it takes a lifetime to grow those trees, we're not really in any hurry to cut them all down at one time. Now you don't use your draft horses just for logging. You use them for row crops and other agricultural purposes here on the farm, don't you? Yes, I do. We, we mow our hay, we rake our hay, we tet our hay. We have a modern uh, uh, ground-driven PTO cart uh, manufactured by the Amish in Pennsylvania that, that we use uh, uh, to run Category 1 uh, modern uh, farm implements. Uh, we plow, disc, harrow, plant cultivate uh, our, our row crops, our corn, and in particular I have uh, some open pollinated, uh, organically grown uh, uh, non-GMO corn uh, that, that's uh, had a pretty good year here in 2014, uh, and, and I'd like to show you some of that. Let's go take a look. I'm dying to see that. All right. So here we are at your corn field, and this is some nice looking corn. Now everything you do here is organic, correct? Yes, it is. It's not certified organic because I don't want to bother with the cost of that, but it's grown without chemical fertilizer, herbicides, or pesticides. And all the fertility that's in this ground is uh, the result of uh, good sound farming practices like crop rotation. Uh, this is the second year that this uh, ground has been uh, in open tillage uh, from old sod. Uh, and we just accept that there's going to be a certain amount of uh, uh, insect uh, damage, and, and we just take a uh, what's left. And of course we're also dealing with uh, predation by wildlife with, uh, in the form of bear and deer. Uh, but this is my open pollinated corn. Uh, it's a 87-day uh, uh, corn that's being, uh, been developed uh, to be a uh, quick season because we do live on the mountain and to be short in height because we get a lot of wind up here at Ridge Wind Farm. So the idea is to have a corn that matures quick enough to dry down even though it's uh, planted in late May. Uh, and to stand the hard winds of the, uh, of the occasional uh, thunderstorms and, and uh, uh, hurricanes we may get here. So this is non-GMO, uh, organically grown or naturally grown, or however you want to say it, um, uh, open pollinated corn. You can actually keep these corn seed uh, and select the ones that have the characteristics that you want and plant them back forever. All of, your co all of this corn is planted using your draft horses. What's the benefit of using your horses as opposed to today's modern machinery? That's a great question, and there are, it's, it has a lot of answers. The first one is independence. I'm able to work these horses on farm-grown fuel, essentially solar energy in the form of hay that I mow and, and grain that I grow, so I don't have to have fossil fuel from an outside source that I don't control the price of. So it gives me an element of independence. But the other reasons is it allows me to uh, work the ground during a wider period of uh, moisture contents. Uh, it doesn't compact the ground as much. So I just feel that uh, for the amount of input, uh, especially out-of-pocket cost, uh, I can produce uh, more food uh, with uh, less money. It does take more energy. It is labor intensive. It takes skill and timing to understand uh, the art of farming, which is, which is a lot of what farming is. Uh, instead of depending on, uh, uh, you know, chemicals to do things, uh, I have to actually use uh, good sound farming practices, crop rotation, conservation tillage, and, uh, and timely uh, uh, cultivation. And that's how I produce this crop of corn. It's not easy, but it's worth it. It is worth it. I th it's, it's like we were speaking of earlier there. Uh, this is a source of dignity for me. This is a source of feeling good about what I'm doing with my life. And nobody uh, has uh, the ability to put a price on my dignity besides myself, and I think that it's priceless. I happen to agree. Thank you for coming. Now, if people would like some more information on your farm, which, where should they go? We have a, a website for the farm under RidgewindSuffolks.com, www.RidgewindSuffolks.com. Okay. You can find out about our, our horses and our farming activities there, and I also have a Facebook presence that you can find under my name, Jason Rutledge. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for having us out today. It's, it's been an amazing journey. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm glad it didn't rain on us. Me too. <laughs> we'll be right back. Evergreen shrubs are quite common in farmhouse landscapes. 
This week we learn how to prune those evergreen shrubs as we go in the garden with Mark Viette. A common question we get is, can I cut down or trim some of my evergreens that have gotten too big, especially around the house or maybe even in the garden? The answer is probably not if they're around the house. In some cases, a common plant that they use around the house is either Hinoki cypress, arborvitae, dwarf Alberta spruce, and to tell if you can prune these or not, there's just, you know, sort of a general guideline, not foolproof, but close. So you're, I'm just gonna show you an example here of a branch. Plants that you might want to avoid trimming or trimming hard are gonna be plants that show very little growth inside the canopy. So even when you pull down these branches and you look inside, I see almost no green or very little green in the way of new shoots. If you were to see a lot of green shoots up and down the stem, that might be an indication that yes, you can still prune it back to where it's still green. The general guideline is you can go back three years if you don't know. So three years is only about maybe five inches. And you can tell even going here three years, there's no growth. So this plant may not regrow. So what you're gonna end up with is when you're done pruning it, you're just gonna end up with a lot of stubs. So what you don't want is something that looks like this because honestly, you're gonna have to live with it. On this beautiful yellow, bright yellow Camacypris, you can see lots of growth sort of around the outer edge. When you peel back some of the edge and look inside, there's very few shoots or very little green growing on the inside. So right away, this should be a sign to you that you might want to prune this, but in a cautionary uh, way. If you look here, there's very little growth inside. And what you don't want to end up with is little stubs. And you can find those. I pruned this out earlier. And maybe three years ago, this branch was pruned here. And as you can see, there is no growth. There never will be growth. So it's really important that you pay attention to the way your plants grow. If they're really vigorous and full, that's an indication it can take a little more whacking back. Now, for those of you who do like to work in a garden and are looking for something to do, I've not forgotten about you. This is one of my favorite. It's a rather large growing juniper. It's juniper hetzai or the hetzai juniper. And it is one you can cut back pretty hard. So compared to the others, if you look at this, look at all the shoots up and down the stem. So you can cut this way back in here, 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 or here to get your work out for the day. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Our pearl of wisdom this week is one I recall from my Navy days many years ago. I was walking through the helicopter hangar on a ship I was stationed on, the USS Thomas C. Hart, a small frigate homeported in Norfolk. And there was a sign on the hangar door that caught my attention. It read, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old bold pilots. Just thought I'd share that with you. Send in your own pearl of wisdom through our website at virginiafarming.com. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming. And now for your Ag Trivia Question of the Week, the answer when we return.
90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. And now the answer to your trivia question of the week. Approximately 17% of Virginia's primary farm operators are female. <laughs>